98% of Vasa that still survives. We have one metal spoon uh, made out of silver. Most all of the chests and, box and boxes and barrels of personal possessions have a wooden spoon in them, regardless of the quality of the other stuff that's in it. There's a doctoral dissertation on that subject, um, on the food prepared in the Navy. Uh, and there's a cookbook available that it annoyed him because you couldn't tell the peasants and the nobles apart because they all lived in wooden houses and dressed the same. Huh. And because they hadn't invented a, uh, an interchangeable chuck yet, I, I can tell you what it's like to learn to carve a spoon. I can't tell you what it's like to carve a spoon. All right, here we are. Welcome everybody to Ruax Spoon Challenge 33 and our very special uh, guest of honor that's with us today, Dr. Fred Hucker. Dr. Fred Hucker from the Vasa Museum in Stockholm, Sweden. Um, he's going to do a, a bit of a talk and tell us about some exciting things that he's working on. Uh, let me give you just a little bit of background. Dr. Fred Hocker is the Director of Research at the Vasa Museum in Stockholm, Sweden. He's a maritime archaeologist who earned his PhD in Texas A&M University's Nautical Archaeology Program in 1991. His research is focused on the technology of seafaring, the history of of ship building, for instance, ships rigging and gunnery, maritime. He worked as a shipbuilder at Mystic Seaport in Connecticut, and he has worked with 17th century ships for most of his career in archaeology. So we are very excited to have uh, Fred with us today. Um, as you all know, we've done a previous uh, spoon challenge where um, Stephanie D'Angela joined us and gave a great talk uh, about the Vasa and a lot of the treen where she did her master's uh, level thesis on um, the treen ware that was discovered as part of the raising of the Vasa. Um, and we had our challenge based on a couple of those spoon forms. And then this challenge, we took two more of those spoon forms to create our templates. Um, and so we had a tremendous amount of fun with that. Uh, people were fascinated, had lots of great questions. I see Stephanie has joined us. Welcome, Stephanie. We're happy to have you with us here again today. Um, so yeah, so with that, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started, and I'm going to um, just spotlight you, uh, Fred, so that everybody can see you front and center. There we go. Uh, and yeah, take it away. Thank you so much for being here with us. Well, it's my pleasure. I, uh, uh, when Stephanie mentioned this to me, I thought this sounds like this sounded like a great thing. Um, and our uh, the info department at the Vossa Museum has been interested in this challenge as well. So I think they might have linked uh, to your uh, your group on our homepage. Woohoo! All right. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Uh, and and uh, as, uh, as you mentioned in the introduction, I didn't start my academic career as an academic. Uh, I was a, a craftsman first, and I worked in a, in a shipyard building and rebuilding wooden ships for a couple of years. I actually dropped out of college to do that, much to my grandfather's concern. And uh, then uh, was a professional craftsman for a while before going back to being a student and then an academic. Uh, and that's, that's informed all of my work since then. Um, I'm a very practically minded person in that way. Uh, and a lot of the research I've done revolves around the interaction between practical knowledge uh, and more abstract kinds of thinking. Um, I gave a talk uh, last fall at uh, um, the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum uh, uh, on the subject of the difference between real experience and imagined experience. Um, what folks like you have is real experience, uh, knowledge in, uh, in your hands, as uh, Samuel Pepys wrote in the 17th century. 
Um, but a lot of my colleagues have what I would call imagined experience. And that is they read books and they think very hard about how things might have been. Um, as a result, I do have a number of colleagues who write very learned tones about how ships were built in the ancient world, but they do not themselves know which end of a hammer you hold on to. <laughs> um, uh, and this leads to some very strange conclusions occasionally. It also leads to a whole strain of argument uh, where people will try to interpret the things we find in the ground or under the water uh, along the lines of saying, well, it, it would have been easier to do this than to do this. Um, but if you don't know how to do either one of those things, you have no possibility of judging which one of them is easier. And if you can do both of them, well, then they're both easy to do. Um, and that's not how, it's not how craftsmen think. Uh, and so uh, that's a whole, it's a very whole, an entire line of very specious, uh, not very helpful reasoning. And so I've always tried to encourage my students and people I work with uh, to get the necessary practical knowledge to understand the objects that we work with. Um, and so a lot of the research we do at the Boston Museum has included practical experiments, uh, reconstructing objects in the technology of the past and testing how to make them and how to use them. Uh, and sometimes that's, uh, it's very small things like spoons, uh, but it's also can be very big things. Uh, in 2014, uh, we cast a 24 pounder cannon in bronze, um, mm. a, ton and a, a ton and a half of bronze, uh, wow. and then built a section of Vasa uh, and fired live 54 rounds of live ammunition over the course of course of two weeks in order to get an idea of what the actual performance of the ship's arm and what was, uh, how effective the ship would be at stopping that kind of uh, firepower uh, and what would be the effect on the people inside. Uh, and there was a lot of theoretical discussion about all of this uh, since the 19th century, um, and which was the last time anyone had done any real experimental data. Uh, although I did discover there'd been a Mythbusters episode testing the whole idea of splinters inside a ship. I was just going to uh, say, it sounds like a Mythbusters uh, activity. Well, it, I love it. It, 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 was, it was very much, and I'm writing a, a, the final publication of that as a book, and I'm trying to get Adam Savage to write the forward for it. Awesome. Uh, we'll, we'll see if he says yes. Uh, so um, uh, and at the moment, we, we have a very big research project going on, uh, which is looking at all of the clothing and shoes uh, on board, found on board the ship. Uh, because of a combination of circumstances that the sailors were mostly conscripts and the Navy didn't provide uniforms or clothing. Um, we have, what we have is the largest collection of ordinary people's everyday clothes from any one site before 1700. Uh, and a lot of that material is really well preserved. Uh, and so one of the things we're doing to understand that material is to replicate it. Uh, and in fact, that's what I'm, I'm doing today. I'll shift my camera over here, to see if you can see. There's a, a big pile of paper and matter red cloth on my table, um, which will be a jacket. That's a copy of one of the ones on the ship. Um, and this actually isn't the test. This is just something for me to wear while I am doing the test, uh, <laughs> which is to hand uh, with two other people to hand sew and knit all of the clothing for two people a man and a woman who were both on board the ship. Uh, plus there's a shoemaker in Virginia who's making their shoes and a hat maker in Boston uh, who's making a hat for one of them. And we out of this, what we really wanna understand is both the construction process. If our, if our reconstruction of how we think this clothing was put together can actually work uh, and then wear that clothing or fire that cannon or eat soup with that spoon, to get a sense of uh, how, what were the ergonomics of it? How well, did, how, how comfortable are this with the clothes? Um, uh, what's the range of the cannon? That sort of things. Uh, and so these kinds of uh, practical skills and practical tests are really important to our research. Uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I think, I was uh, giving a, a lecture at the Swedish Institute for Hemsloid or home crafts, uh, where they have four main areas of, uh, or directions in their curriculum. You can spend up to three years studying there and get a degree uh, in what's called in Sweden, Hemsloid. Uh, 
which uh, you can either study weaving or tailoring, sewing, traditional sewing, uh, or you can study traditional woodworking or blacksmithing. Uh, and you can cross the boundaries between them and they do a lot of projects that way. Uh, and these are people who are, want to do this either as a career or they're taking a break from a career to do that. Uh, and they're, the work they do in the woodworking program starts with uh, uh, whittling, with carving uh, things like spoons um, and works all the way up to making furniture or even buildings. Uh, and so, and, and you can, and they want to do, you could call them thesis projects. So I have four of those students this spring who will be doing their thesis projects by copying wooden things from Boston. Awesome. Right. Um, this is part of something that we're trying to do, uh, which is a, a book uh, called Vasa Woodworking. Um, and this, this is something I worked out with Chris Schwartz at uh, Lost Art Press uh, uh, to do, because they do a lot of books on traditional hand uh, skills in woodworking, uh, yep. including some stuff very closely focused on the 17th century, thanks to an Englishman named Peter Follinsby. Uh, how you start with a tree and end up with a stool or a chair or a table or, or a spoon. Yep. I have uh, several so, books on my shelf right here next yep. to me. <laughs> so, so do I. I, I, I. I'm that kind of anarchist myself. Uh, I'm, I, I am still a craftsman. I don't, I sew, but I also uh, make musical instruments uh, as well as have a fairly extensive machine shop in my shed. Nice. Uh, the uh, and that book would be uh, an, both a philosophical investigation of the nature of woodworking in Sweden at the time that Vasa sailed, based on the things we found on the ship, as well as a group of about twenty projects that people could do. Uh, that we you know, provides the drawings if you want to build a copy of the tool chest or a copy of the dining table that was found on the ship. <clears throat> Plus, uh, we'll reconstruct each one of those things and document the process so we can provide a how-to for people who want to make a copy of the table or the, um, the, the chest so or cool. something like that. Uh, and so part of that project has been recruiting people who will make copies and document the process if they'll agree to make those copies using the same techniques that were used in the 17th century. Um, and what I was going to throw out to your group um, is that one of the things that we want to include in there, uh, and I'll explain why in a minute, is things like spoons. Uh, is that because there's a lot of carved work of various types uh, found on the ship? Uh, not you know, everything from what you could call folk art in the form of spoons and utilitarian objects up to 780 some uh, large scale sculptures all over the outside of the ship. Mm. Uh, Figure, figural sculptures, whole humans uh, up to eight feet tall wow. uh, in, in different places on the ship. Uh, and so, and, and some of this material was whittled by sailors in their spare time, and some of it was carved by the best artists uh, working and then working in Sweden. Um, when we look at the, all of the woodworking, uh, we actually have a cross section of every level of woodworking uh, that was being practiced in Sweden in the 1620s from folk art uh, uh, in terms of scale and simplicity up mm -hmm. to the scale of building a whole ship. We have a whole ship. There's 98% of Vasa that still survives. That's amazing. Um, but in terms of quality level, we also have the interior of the Admiral's cabin, the great cabin. Uh, this is where the King would stay if he were on board. Uh, this is where um, the, an Admiral would stay if the King wasn't on board. And legally, that cabin is not part of the ship. Legally, it's part of the royal palace. It's an embassy. Wow. Uh, and, so the, and so the king sent his own joiners to the Navy Yard to fit out the interior. It's done in the highest quality imported hardwoods uh, that you could have found in, uh, in Sweden at the time. Uh, it's, it's all done in the most perfect, straight-grained, radially converted pencil stripe oak you've ever seen. There is not a knot in the entire cabin. Um, it's, it, it's just incredibly elegant finish. And then it was all uh, stained and varnished, not painted. Uh, and so that, that would have been the highest level of woodworking available because it was the king's personal 
joiners and, and cabinet makers who did that interior. Um, and it includes incredibly fine sculptural ornaments done in lime wood, basswood, yeah. uh, as well as uh, a lot of oak carving. Uh, it's mostly fixed structure, but there is some mo movable furniture in the form of the biddicle, uh, the big cupboard you kept the ship's compasses in, which are in the ante room to that, uh, to that room. Uh, and that's uh, the most complicated biddicle I've ever seen. Um, so that uh, you can, you really get a sense of that, as well as all the decoration on the door, which included intarsia inlay that would have paint, presented a scene on the door to give you an idea of what was on the other side of the door or what should be on the other side of the door, uh, as well as all of this really high quality material. And in between we have uh, chests and boxes, some of which are just six boards nailed together and others have fine dovetail joinery at the corners. Uh, some of, lots of applied moldings uh, that's been made with, in long sticks with molding planes. And we have a lot of tools found on the ship, about 250 altogether. Uh, although unfortunately most, most of that is sticks about this long uh, because all of the iron disappeared. Ooh. So we don't have any of the blades of anything, but there are different kinds of planes, molding planes, jack planes, smoothing planes, uh, small delicate turning saws and great big ship saws, uh, caulking tools. Uh, there's a lovely set of matched uh, graduated braces, uh, brace and bit type drills. Mm -hmm. And because they hadn't invented a, uh, an interchangeable chuck yet, uh, you had to have a separate brace for each drill bit. And so there are four sizes because you have a bigger brace for a bigger drill. Um, and they're all yeah. clearly made by the same person with very fine turned knaves in hardwood at the top. Um, and so part of that, part of the book will focus on the things, the tools. There's a joiner's bench. Uh, so a, a nine foot long workbench uh, that is very much in the style that nowadays is called a Rubo uh, bench. Mm -hmm. uh, although this is a hundred years before Rubo wrote about it, uh, but it's exactly the same kind of bench he described. Uh, there's also a little knee-high saw bench uh, for breaking up stock, uh, as well as a chest, very nice tool chest full of tools, as well as the personal possessions of one of the carpenters, his hat and his money and a pair of gloves, mm -hmm. for example. And so we want to illustrate all of that. We want to make that material available to people. Um, uh, some of it's really interesting. Uh, some of it, I have to say, is really ugly. Um, the, the, not, not every single woodworker in history had a good sense of line or proportion. Um, <laughs> and, and so there's, there's plenty of stuff we have that is not the kind of stuff you'd really want to grace your living. Um, but some of, but some of it is, um, and some of it could be easily repurposed. You could turn the, the biddicle, uh, make a sideboard to that design if you wanted to do that or something like that. Um, and so and, and the where, where all of this starts is with the kinds of studies that uh, Stephanie did, where we take a, an entire group of finds that all somehow belong together, usually on the basis of function, mm -hmm. um, and document them in detail so we have a good sense. And so when Stephanie looked at the 83 spoons we have on the ship, she looked at every single one and was able to determine what are the, what are the typical patterns, what are the... The, the kinds of decoration you see, what are the wild cards, um, which carvers were good at what they were doing and which ones weren't so good, uh, and that sort of thing. And which gives us a really clear sense of the, the human side of this. Um, there's there's, a, there, there's a, a tendency in the modern world to, and I'm gonna risk offending people here, to, um, to overpraise hand craftsmanship because people mm. don't do it anymore. Uh, and so there's this tendency to think that, you know, woodworkers in the past were all God's gift to woodworking. Right. But it's just like today, there's, there's good plumbers and bad plumbers. You hope you get a good one when your sink busts. Um, but if the economy is right, a bad plumber can still make a living. Uh, and so a bad woodworker can still make some kind of a living. And we can see that in the in the material as well. We get a, a real sense of the cross section, the range of variation, not just the best of the best, which is what survives in museums. You know, the, 
the badly made ugly stuff doesn't doesn't live long enough to get into a museum collection. Yeah, but it does find but it does find its way into archaeological sites and shipwrecks. Yeah, Ste so, Stephanie and, Stephanie shared her her thesis with this group. Yeah, and and it was such a gift, you know, just I mean to, the the context for all those finds and the variety, and then you know the materials and and uh, and then other other train besides spoons, you know. Anyway, the still sort of amazed that that book exists that that thesis exists yeah well and 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 some of that material is incredibly fine we have five lathe turned jugs uh made out of birch burl which is almost impossible to lathe turn you have to soak it get it soaking wet um and a, there's a fellow who's written a history of turning an englishman uh who strangely enough has the last name of turner uh, and he, uh, he, when he came and looked at our material and looked at that, he said, blurted out, I, said, I, I think I only know five people who could do that. Um, because these are jugs up to a foot or more tall, uh, and the wall thickness is only a little over an eighth of an inch. Wow. Um, and, and, the, and the necks are only about two to three inches across. So you're working with some kind of long hook tool to get to, into the interior to hollow out the interior. And you're working blind pretty much, right? Cause you can't, it's all you can see down in there to see like what you're doing. Right, but, but if you're working on a jug that's a foot tall through a two inch opening. Yeah. Um, and then it's, and it's about seven inches in diameter. You know, you can't see the inside. You're gonna have, you have to do it all by feel. It's all feel, yeah. It was, yeah. And it was watertight. Uh, yeah, well, presumably they were originally that uh, they're made out of birch pearl. Um, so I mean, it's it's wood, so water would soak through it. Um, one of them has some kind of fatty residue on the inside, um, and the, uh, so it was used to hold some kind of foodstuffs. I would love to see those birch pearl. Seems like a crazy choice for that because of the only a eighth of an inch thick. The grain would crack and split and do all sorts of things. So, oh, that's oh yeah. <laughs> uh, was this, was this part what's, of what's amazing is. Yeah, what's amazing is that four of them are intact, um, and one oh, yeah. of them, the bottom, the bottom broke off of the rest of it. Um, but they survived 333 years underwater, and then being freeze dried. So That's incredible. Sort of, was this part of the king's? Um, uh, no, they were. They were in a barrel uh, with a bunch of other personal possessions found up in the bow of the ship. Um, Probably, I mean, it, it represented some kind of investment because there's there's five of them, and it and I have to imagine to make five you probably started twelve, um, or something like that because you you certainly break some in the process, um, no matter how good a turner you are because you'll you'll encounter flaws in the wood and that yeah. you can't see because they're on the inside that kind of thing. My knowledge, um, my knowledge of wood grain that shouldn't even work. So that's amazing. <laughs> Exactly. Well, what what I've I, I've talked to a turner who turns in uh, birch pearl, uh, and he says that you have to soak it, you have to get it dripping wet, and then it cuts more like cheese than it cuts like wood. Yeah. Mm. But you have to work it not just work it green, but green and then get it wet. Um, and there's still a great chance that it'll turn. You know, it'll it'll destroy itself either in the turning or when it dries out right. after right. you've turned it. So just a second, I have to go plug in my computer so it doesn't die while we're talking. So think yeah. about some good questions. That, no that's worries. mostly what I was going to say I, to you anyway. I've got one so queued up for you when you come back. All right, so I'll, be, I'll be right back. Okay, and I'm sure many others out there do too. Um, we've, got some, we've got some very experienced Turner friends on Rise Up and Carve. We got to get them to look at those, look at those images and tell us if, that's, if, it's, if it seems mind bending to them. So just a quick, uh, moment here to explain for anybody who's joined in and either didn't see the posts about this or are we are now uh, just coming up on nine o'clock this is when we would normally start our show and tell however we were blessed to have the opportunity to speak with dr fred hawker from the vasa museum um and so while we have him here i i kind of i'm i'm willing for us to wait to start our show and tell until he's you know uh, ready for that uh, and for for Q and A. So yep, there's, uh, Fred, one the, there's one of the uh, jars. Wow. Yeah, that's very cool. 
right? But that one, that one still has its lid on it. That's a lid, right? Yeah, wow. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's a turned lid. And so it's interesting, some of the turned lids are turned, uh, they're turned live uh, with the, the, what would be the pith of the tree going down the middle. And so a couple of the lids actually still have the bark around the outer edge. Oh, wow. Clearly, clearly done as a decorative feature. A line. Why, was, why, was why was such a nice... Split? I don't know. That seems like that should just fall apart as it dries if it's birch burl. <laughs> why why would, would they think. put such a such a nice um, vessel, uh, you know, vase or whatever the bowl onto a ship like that? Well, the, the, there's a lot of nice nice ish stuff uh, found on the ship. People took their personal possessions with them. Uh, I can't. I haven't looked enough at these yet and the context around them to understand what else is in that barrel, except it is. It's all personal possessions. It's not ship's equipment. And this is an area right up in the bow of the ship on the upper gun deck where there are a whole lot of boxes and chests and barrels full of people's personal possessions. And most of that is stuff that's of, you would say, higher quality, not, not just ordinary sailor stuff. Um, and so uh, we're trying to look at each one of those containers to get a sense of who that person was by what was in there. Uh, the clothing, one of the sets of clothing we're reconstructing uh, is from another barrel that's up in that area. Um, and that that fellow had, in addition to a complete spare set of clothing, which many was fairly wealthy, because most people only owned one set of clothes. Uh, he had a spare set of pair of shoes. Uh, he had a very nice sword belt and a rapier, uh, as well as a big, a big wad of money that he kept in there, one of the largest collections of coins found on the ship. Uh, as well, but he also had some tools. He had a little hammer and awls for doing leather work. Um, so, I, I, so I, one of the questions we have is who, how do you decide what you're going to take with you if you go to sea? I have a, a question. When you were talking about, um, you know, for this book where you're having people do, um, you know, reconstructions, attempting to copy items from the museum's collection. Mm -hmm. When they do that, are they using, I'm, I'm, I was so disappointed to hear that there's no actual ironwork from any of the tools, because it would be really interesting to see what the quality of the, the ironwork, the steel, the edges that they had to work with on their tools, because we're using modern reproductions, but they're using modern steels, highly, you know, polished and ground high quality tools that for all I know, I mean, they may have only had something that would be the equivalent of what I could do with a grinder in my garage on a lump of steel that I could, you know, beat over an anvil, anvil uh, and would be a very rough tool. So I'm curious, like when you ask people to do their reproductions, I mean, we only have tools that we can access in the modern mm -hmm. world. So but but that plays such a huge part in the quality of the final product. How do you it, like reconcile or work with that? Yeah, it can. Um, it's one of the reasons we ask people to at least use traditional types of tools so that the the, the hand motion and all that is the same. Mm. Um, we do have other evidence from Sweden of what kinds of metals were available and used in tools. Okay. Um, and uh, Sweden was already very well known by the 17th century for uh, uh, producing uh, about the highest quality raw material for making steel that you had available in Northern Europe. Um, okay. The nature of the iron ore in Sweden is such that uh, the iron, the raw, the wrought iron that you can get out of it uh, has very few impurities. Uh, and so it can, and it combines readily with carbon to form good quality steels. Uh, there's still, pe you know, people still talk about Swedish steel. Um, mm -hmm. And if you talk about Sheffield steel, the raw iron for Sheffield steel comes out of a hole in the ground in Sweden. Wow. Uh, but, but, and it has to do with the chemistry of the ore um, uh, makes it easier to produce, uh, to, to combine it with carbon to make good quality steel. Uh, and Sweden produced good quality steel, especially after the 1620s and the introduction of uh, the Walloon Forge for um, converting uh, uh, iron into a good raw material. 
uh, it raised the raised the bar even farther. Um, and there is some surviving 17th century exported steel. It's really a very good quality. So if uh, if you were to make your tools out of a, a decent 1085 plain carbon steel, you would be replicating pretty closely what a, car, you know, a craftsman in Sweden in the 17th century had available. And, mm -hmm. and, and you could have polished that edge just as finely then as you could now, and it would just take you a little longer. Okay. So mm -hmm. the, I'm, I'm not too concerned about, I guess, I guess the bottom line there, I'm not too concerned about that. Um, there's, a, there's a tendency again to think that old is crude, equals crude. Mm -hmm. um, it's, the, it's the other side of the all, you know, hand craftsmen are touched by God in their childhoods. Uh, myth that, uh, in fact, the quality of the tools and tool edges um, have there have always been good quality tools available since people were started working with stones. Um, that uh, people early on developed a, a good knowledge of what you need in an edge to make it work. Okay. And people in the Neolithic could make razors and surgical tools out of obsidian. Um, and they, then in the Bronze Age, they could do the same thing with bronze. Um, it, to, bronze just doesn't hold an edge as long. Um, and, and, and then once wrought iron and steel came along, you, you basically you, the, the, the understanding of edge geometry it goes back to stone tools. The understanding of, um, I think, in knowing in your hand how to tell when an edge is sharp or dull goes back to stone tools. Uh, and what changes is that the different materials as they're developed produce an edge that lasts longer more than anything else. Okay. Um, and, with, and with the better quality steels, you can get a finer edge. In other words, a, a, a skinnier edge, mm -hmm. a narrower blade uh, edge geometry, which means you can make shaving edges uh, more effectively. Interesting. Um, but, but really, the, the understanding of tool technology and what makes a good tool and a bad one is thousands of years old. Awesome. I've seen they, a couple other questions come up. So. Yeah, with, were they yeah. using stones for sharpening? I mean, that, so that's the next question is, what do you use to, to sharpen the tools? No, stones. Uh, we have a whole bunch of them, of, of sharpening stones found on the ship. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and there was, a, there was a, a real pecking order in what kinds of stones you used for sharpening stuff. Um, and already in Northern Europe, already by the early Iron Age, uh, there were certain areas that were well known for producing very good quality sharpening stones if you wanted to get a good edge. Uh, and so there are areas in Germany, for example, that exported sharpening stones all over Northern Europe over 2000 years ago. Um, by the 17th century, the Swedish, Swedish craftsmen um, imported sharpening stones from England um, because there were particular beds of stone there that worked very well. Uh, just like before, before uh, uh, man-made stones became popular, when I, when I was an apprentice, you know, your top quality stone was an Arkansas stone. It came out of you know, a bed that produced just the right kind of silicates to to, to grind and polish tool edges. And so that, that, that knowledge goes way back as well. So there's I, a- I wanna, Excuse me, I wanna make a question uh, because uh, <clears throat> I live in Sweden too. And I remember that a couple of years ago or maybe it's 10 years, time goes so fast. There was an um, ad about oak that was uh, grown purely uh, in the, for making warships. So do you know what happened to that oak? Because there was a lot of oak, what I understood. Uh, yes, um, in, the, in the 18th century, um, in order to provide the Navy with a secure supply of oak uh, that would be good for shipbuilding, uh, the Crown uh, planted oaks on an island in one of the big central Swedish lakes, an island called Visingsö. Uh, and they, you know, they, they, they did a very good job estimating what their oak requirements were gonna be uh, when those trees were ready in 200 years. Uh, and then 
and 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 then and then appointed foresters who looked after this forest on the island of uh, Vicenza. Uh, but then, long before those trees were ready, they quit building ships out of wood and started building them out of iron and steel. But in in one of those things that happens in government bureaucracies, they they still kept paying the foresters to look after the forest. Uh, and it's a famous story in Sweden that, and depending on who tells it, at some date, usually it's in the 1970s, uh, the foresters called the royal palace to inform the king that his trees were ready. Um, I, I believe it's apocryphal and I believe it was a joke at the time. Um, yeah. However, however, the island of Isingsa does have a large stand of mature oak trees on it that were planted 250 years ago. Um, and that, ma that material is available for people to use by application to, I think, maybe the Royal Palace. I'm, I'm not entirely sure who you apply to. Um, it was not, it, you know, it wasn't needed for building ships. Although when the Vasa Museum built a full-size copy of the upper, after third of the upper gun deck as part of the museum environment interior, so that people can walk around uh, in a space that looks like the inside of the ship. Uh, that copy of Vasa was built with oak from the island of Isingsa. Great. Well, then I know at least what some of it was being used for. Right. But, but I know that um, if you, if you I, I, I drive past that island every now and then, and you can see that they've been harvesting the trees. It's not all yeah. completely covered with timber anymore. Um, and so, uh, but it's, you know, it's a, it's a fairly big island with a lot of trees on it. Um, and yeah. the demand just isn't that big. So I have a okay. question. Well, for thank Stephanie. you for the answer. Sure. I had a question for Stephanie, since I know she's seen a couple of the spoons that I made. How do they compare to what came out of the ship? You know, you've had, you've had a chance to look at both of them. You know, what, how do the modern copies compare? I, they are, I haven't used them, of course, because I don't want to use them they're so beautiful and precious so no! <laughs> that's the bane of every spoon carver's existence it's too pretty it's, to use it's okay chuck we'll give her a break on that <laughs> <laughs> but they look i mean it was really neat to actually see them and hold them because i, I did my thesis quite a few years ago and it was they were i mean nearly identical um so a real uh, I, I will use them when i get home i'm traveling but i'm back home in montana right now but when i get home i promise I will use them. I will take them off the, the mantle where I have them. <laughs> the other quick question I have is around making copies. You know, how important is the wood choice or the grain orientation? You know, are you looking for down to the last detail or are you just looking for something that is rep representative? Well, um, that's a good question. The, uh, and, and that's, a, that's a fundamental question in experimental archaeology generally. Uh, because the question is, what is it you are trying to replicate? Are you trying to replicate the object itself as accurately as possible? Or are you trying to rep replicate the process uh, as accurately as possible? And if, it's, if you're fo focusing on the process, the process is very much informed or determined by the raw material. Uh, and so... Uh, and any decent woodworker is sensitive to the material he's working with, just like a, any decent tailor or blacksmith. Uh, and so if you are replicating the process, the object will turn out slightly different than the one you're copying because the piece of wood you're starting with is slightly different. Uh, and so what we often do uh, is we divide that process of experimental archaeology into those two different areas. If we, if we want to replicate the object itself accurately, we can't always replicate the process because we might not understand the process. We might have to use modern processes to get an object that is an accurate reproduction if we want to retest how that object functions. But if we want to understand the, the process, then we worry less about whether the final object exactly matches uh, the pattern we're starting with. Um, it's, hard, it's really hard to test both of those things simultaneously. Uh, and so in this case, what we're interested in telling people uh, is, or, or getting across to people is much more the idea of process, how you worked wood in the 17th century 
than we are in the, the object. Um, there, because if people want to replicate the object exactly, they'll have a drawing in the book that will give them all the dimensions they need to make an exact copy. But if what they want to do is explore the process, we want to give them the necessary information that they can use to do that. Um, does that make, does that answer your question? Yeah, that's helpful. I mean, obviously it's, uh, the process is what we do and it's part of this group, but it, you know, it's harder for right. me to get each wood and it's harder to get specific sizes of wood um, in my part of the world. Exactly. So, and, and we see the same problems afflicting craftsmen in the 17th century. We see, we don't just see this kind of object is always made out of this kind of wood. Uh, we might see that mostly it's made out of this kind of wood, but we do have three that are made out of something else. Uh, there's a great example in the ship's rigging. Uh, all of, almost all of the blocks, um, pulleys, uh, mm -hmm. are made out of ash uh, for very specific reasons. It's, it's shock resistant. That's why they make baseball bats out of it. Uh, it, uh, it. It also, as it wears, it maintains a smooth surface that doesn't abrade the things around it. It doesn't get splintering. Um, and that the, but the exceptions to that are blocks that are too big to get out of the available ash trees that we have in Sweden, uh, or blocks that are gonna be used with the tackles on the cannon because they just get the holy hell beat out of them. Um, and there the hard, the extra hardness of the oak is probably an advantage, they'll, they'll last longer that way. So in those two cases, they use oak. But we do have an example of one block uh, that's made out of birch is a terrible wood to make a block out of um, for three or four different reasons. Um, and the person who did it was clearly copying the idea and the basic proportions of that kind of block, which is normally made in ash. And they did it really badly. That uh, it's a real hack job. Uh, mm. it, it looks like they made it with a dull hatchet. Um, and, and it's not very well finished on the outside. Um, it's, it's got lots, of, you'd never be able to use it, I think, except in an emergency, but somebody went to the trouble to make it. Um, and, and it might be that the only, he needed a block and the only piece of wood he had that was big enough was a chunk of firewood. Mm. They, and and they, I, I confess I've done that. The firewood we get here is birch and it, it's not very good for a lot of things, but occasionally I've in a, in a pinch made stuff out of the firewood sitting they, on my back porch. Do they know the wood type on the spoons? Um, Steph, that's an answer question for you. Um, yes, we had, we didn't do actual wood testing on any of the spoons, but, um, and Fred was definitely a huge help, obviously, throughout the writing and research of my thesis. Um, and through his expertise, we were able to give, I think it was more than a best guess. You pretty much knew what a lot of the spoons were made of. We thought some of the more, um, I, don't, I guess, unique in the collection that didn't maybe have a, um, a type, uh, the one-offs were even some juniper, possibly, and some alder. Um, but most of them were made, uh, what did we think, Fred? I can't remember, it's, it has been a long time. Was it beach? <laughs> uh, not very much beach, to be honest, a hmm. uh, ah. little bit. Uh, limewood, uh, basswood, uh, seems Gosh. to have been used a lot for carving all kinds of small things. Mm. Uh, and it grows in Sweden, so it's readily available. Um, I think there's uh, alder, like uh, Steph says. Um, no oak. Isn't there one? Is there? Do I remember that there's one made out of ash? I feel like there is. I'd have to. Yeah. That sounds yeah. right. So we've, which, which we've be interesting. We've so. selected four for this group, you know, and then people have also gone into the the online catalog with Stephanie's photos, which is amazing. Um, but the but the one of the four at least that we selected is listed as beech wood. So everyone's a little yeah. preoccupied with finding beech to carve these spoons, you know. <laughs> but that's just those four. Um, yeah. Fred, could I ask you a question about the archaeology of, of Vasa? Um, yeah. So this this you've said a number of things like the sailors providing their own kit and clothing, um, and then the the amazing 
um, collection resulting from you know the sinking of the ship of like everyday material culture, and there were civilians on board the Vasa when it sank. So I was just wondering, like in the assemblage of artifacts from Vasa, can can you does it is is it legible as two separate assemblages? One being sort of not shipboard people, but city people, you know, who were on the ship for its maiden voyage. Um, like I know that if uh, the 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 person with the rapier had an extra pair of shoes, so he was probably staying on board. Um, but I mean, uh, other than that, like, do you have a, a sense for sort of who who didn't belong? Yeah, that's a good question, and and that's one of the one of our major research questions in looking at these personal possessions, as well as the remains of fifteen to seventeen people uh, who were found on the ship. Uh, and uh, there's some, there is some historical data. We know, for example, uh, that most of the crew were conscripts and the Navy didn't provide them with clothing. Uh, and so they're not going to look any different than guests. They're, they're not going to. And, and at this point, there is no distinctive sailors clothing in Sweden. These, these are farm boys who've been conscripted into the Navy and they're wearing the same clothes they had on when they left home. Um, we also know that the Navy specifically in its regulations allowed sailors to have their wives on board the ship, staying on the ship, as long as the ship was in home waters. If they left Sweden to go overseas, then they were supposed to put women ashore. Uh, and you weren't supposed to go anywhere you might encounter the enemy uh, with women and children on board. Uh, but the Navy made some nominal effort to look after the families of the men it conscripted. The Army didn't at all. The Navy did. And the Navy provided some housing for them in Stockholm, but also it allowed sailors to bring their wives with them on the ship. Uh, and so two of the skeletons found on board are women. Uh, they're both found together with male skeletons, logically their husbands. Uh, and uh, so they may have been on board for the longer term. But we also know from one of the eyewitness accounts of the sinking, that there were a number of people who were on board just as guests for the first afternoon. That that evening the ship would have, the ship would only have sailed about twelve miles, uh, and then would have anchored at a place called Vauxholm, uh, where there was a regular ferry service, uh, and those people would have gotten the ferry back to back to town that evening. Uh, and in fact, that was what one of the accounts said that the, there were, in addition to the crew, there were women and children on board who were who were going to get off at Vauxholm and come home. Uh, but we, but the question is, can we tell the difference between somebody who's on board just for the afternoon and somebody who's part of the shipboard community? And that's, that's a word we use a lot, uh, because on board a ship, you have the crew that those are the people who are paid to operate the ship, but you also have other people on board the ship permanently or semi semi permanently who aren't part of the crew. Uh, so what you have is what we call the ship's community all the people who are living on the ship, mm. which includes the crew as a big subset, but some other people. So you have the wives of sailors, they're part of the shipboard community. They have a role in that community. Uh, you have uh, people who are called uh, volunteers, uh, who were young noblemen, who were trying to get a good start on a military career. And so they would do that just that. They would volunteer to go as a, a kind of extra officer trainee at their own expense on board a warship. Um, and so there might be people who are have some economic means who are on board, but don't have any real status on the ship. And so the fellow with the extra pair of shoes and the rapier, he might be a volunteer or he might be one of the ship's own officers. Uh, and and they just temporarily stowed all of the personal possessions up in the bow until they could get away from the pier and, and stow the ship for real. Um, the other thing that we uh, are trying to do is to try to distinguish between uh, objects that are personal possessions and objects that are, you could say, community property or the ship's equipment. Because hmm. the Navy did provide some material. Um, I think Stephanie's uh, research suggested pretty clearly that uh, the Navy provided bowls for the men to eat out of. Um, and because they're all very similar, same kind of material turned to very similar patterns, even when they're found inside containers of personal possessions. 
um, and they're all seem to be to a standard size. Uh, and so that, that suggests that there might be that the Turner shop at the, uh, at the Navy Yard was producing some kind, some of the equipment that was used to, mm. to, to feed the crew. I saw a question earlier about how was the crew fed. Um, so I should probably answer that here. I, the, um, I got a question on, <clears throat> on that, that covering just what you had stated. Oh yeah, here we go. <clears throat> and goes into good. With, the, with the food. Yep. The, the, on the ship, if they were supplying the ship, if you have, I, I noticed on the spoons, the spoons all had not a deeper, deeper bowls. You know, when we're looking at the eating off of these spoons, I, I was like, wow, these are very deep than what we'd normally eat out of the, as a spoon. So I was wondering if the spoons were made because you're living on a ship. Because I, I had a friend and I was asking, I was like, why are these spoons so deep? And I didn't realize, she says, oh, they might have been made so deep is because you're living on a boat and the boat's always rocking. She had lived on, on water for like two years. And she said, when the ship is always rocking, you, you tend to um, utensils, you're eating out of bowls more, you're eating out of your spoons were a little deeper bowled. And I was wondering if the treen was found on the ship was different than the treen that you might have been finding in land. Uh, well, th there's a couple of parts to that. Stephanie can answer the one about how similar balsa spoons are to spoons on land. I, I can't answer that question. But before I turn it over to her, I'll say that we do know what that most of the diet, um, the, the meals were mostly stew of various types and thick soups. Uh, and so, and the spoon is your main eating utensil along with a knife. Uh, and so a deep bowl spoon is, is a good option if you're, most of what you're eating is soup and stew. Mm. Um, I've worked on plenty of ships in a maritime career, sailing around in the Atlantic. And mostly they've been ships that are not as big as Vasa, but they're not small boats. And we never had anything other than normal household spoons. And, 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 and I didn't end up wearing my dinner very often. <laughs> just, you just, what, what you discover is it, if you, when you're eating on board a ship, you don't lean back on a chair or a bench. You, you, you hold yourself away from it and your body will naturally, once you've been on board, even all of that out. So you can get a spoon from the bowl up to your mouth without spilling it. Um, but uh, I, I, my, so my guess is the shape of the spoon has much more to do with the kind of food they're eating than anything else. But Steph, what did you find out about how Vasa spoons compare to land spoons? Um, I did some comparative to both other shipwreck sites and some terrestrial spoons and found for the most part that they're they're pretty similar, which I think also for the most part um, and, and makes good sense um, that you would not have to necessarily reinvent the wheel and uh, um, use what you already might have back home on the farm. Um, but that was pretty minimal with the terrestrial side of things. I mean, actually, when I went across the street to the, what is it, the Nordic Museum, I believe? Nord yeah. Yep. Yeah. Nordica. Nordiska. Yeah. yeah, Nordiska. They did have a collection of spoons that were very much like um, one of the real, probably the most simple types that were found on Vasa. So the more on ornate ones. I didn't find exact uh, similarities in terrestrial, but definitely the, the real basic ones. Um, they're just like the spoons you'd find. And I think that's what we do when we go on a, on a ship today. We, we bring our spoon that we have from home. I'm, I'm kind of curious, was there any evidence that, that were spoons? I mean, these were obviously, we're talking like small personal objects. Was this like, people went to their local spoon store and bought spoons or was everybody just basically making their own spoons or somebody in their family, you know, carving spoons, uh, you know, bowls turned objects requiring a lathe or something like that it makes more sense that like, like you said, the Navy might provide it in the case of, you know, ships or there might be a local turner who's turning these out for people in the, whatever their local community is. Spoons though, is something pretty much, you know, your common, person with regular uh, tools could could sit and and do. I'm just curious, like how many of them are, are just carved like personal objects versus acquired from somebody else, you know, else? Do uh, we know? That's over to, that, that's Steph again. 
<laughs> well, I, I will start out by saying that not everybody can carve a spoon because that was definitely one of my, and I, I joked about this last time we talked, one of my <laughs> um, uh, attempts at, to incorporate into my thesis some experimental archaeology and I failed miserably. Um, my spoon blank sat on my desk for almost a decade. So I, I, I think, and I'm, I'm trying to remember back to my research, but that it would have still been a precious item, but it also would have been something that, I mean, you have your own personal spoon, but you very likely there was a local place you would get it. Um, as, I mean, we've gone throughout history, you know, from specialization to um, different uh, degrees of specialization for communities. So I don't have a definitive answer for that. Fred, gotcha. like generally, what do you think? Um, my, my impression is that, is that you're right. Um, we have we have an we have an we have this one pattern a very plain spoon with a straight handle on it that we have a bunch of uh, from a, from several different contexts that that looks like uh, and, and and I would say looking at the tool marks in them it's somebody who knows what they're doing and doing it fast got it and, and so if if you want if you couldn't carve a spoon there was somebody who could provide it um, but then we have a whole bunch of spoons that are unique. That are very individualized. Okay. Um, some of which are beautiful, and some of which are ugly. Um, like I said, not not everybody's got a sense of form or line. I'm curious. Uh, or, or would you want hand skills? And I don't. I don't. Oh. Sorry, just quick. It's just quickly. Would you be able to point us to that particular spoon that you were talking about? Was very common. Uh, I bet Steph can pull up a picture pretty quickly if if we ask her. You you know the one I'm referring to, don't don't you, Steph? Yes, I think I do. That one that was there was a bunch found together, like in a um, yeah, big round, big round bowl with a straight kind of round. I'm curious if it might be one of the ones that we chose for one of our templates. Yeah, a, a yeah. question that might be nice to answer at the same time as these other questions is: those different That's class, it. those different classes of people, did they all use similar spoons? Uh, Steph. Oh. Well, so I guess that's something to remember about the different types of material. Um, so I was just looking at the wooden spoons and there was also, um, uh, I believe, pewter and other materials that tableware was made from on the vessel. We have, we, we have one metal spoon uh, made out of silver. One metal. There was one metal spoon. All the others are are wooden. And I will say that almost all of the Chests and, box and boxes and barrels of personal possessions have a wooden spoon in them, regardless of the quality of the other stuff that's in it. Uh, something to remember is that uh, there's not a lot of stratification of Swedish society in this period. Uh, a, a, a French nobleman visited Sweden in the 1620s and famously remarked that it annoyed him because you couldn't tell the peasants and the nobles apart because they all lived in wooden houses and dressed the same. <laughs> wow. Um, that you just don't have that much, except for a, a small number of families who had titles, who were counts and dukes. Um, people who were nobles were really just slightly better off peasants. Um, and so they dressed very similarly. Um, Sweden didn't really have sumptuary laws to regulate your dress because nobody really could afford to dress well, except for a handful of people, uh, and the, it, it was a wood culture. If you look at, if you compare Sweden in the 1620s to Germany or France or England or the Netherlands in the 1620s, lots of stuff that in those countries is made out of metal or ceramics or stone, it's made out of wood in Sweden, even, you know, even in high-class people's houses. Um, so we have, we do have some pewter plates and bowls and chargers and tankards and stuff like that. Um, but we have their equivalents in wood uh, in large numbers as well. But we don't seem to see the same stratification in the spoons that we see in everything else. So we, we don't have a big collection of pewter spoons to go with our big collection of pewter plates, for example. And uh, the, you, you, put, you held up a drawing there, uh, Chuck. Yeah, um, it was from our Ruax Spoon Challenge 30. There you go. That that that's the common pattern right there. Yep. Exactly, and that's what we one of those uh, was the one that we based this one off of. I forget exactly which one, but yeah. it looked very similar to that first one. 
Right, but I, I can tell you just looking at the find numbers uh, that these are found all over the ship in uh, different places, although 19284, 285, and 286 are all found together in the same barrel. Interesting. Very cool. Yeah. What Chuck, other I was questions gonna... we have here? Oh. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, I mean, question and answer should continue, but um, uh, before we transition to the show and tell, you know, we're, we're an hour in. Um, Fred, what, what can we do for the museum? Well, um, carve, carve some spoons. <laughs> the, uh, if, uh, if we provided more data on uh, a wider variety of the kinds of spoons we have on board, what we'd like to do is, is have people replicate those using traditional tools um, and document the process uh, from ideally starting with a log and, and a hatchet and, and working your way down to the, 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 the final product. That's uh, mostly what be, we do. <laughs> oh, there, there you go. Uh, and it would be great if we had people who were interested in painting some spoons or and then scratching away the paint because we do have some spoons that are decorated that way. Um, and, and, and using them. So, you know, so document, you know, if we could get somebody to get you, get you a turned lime wood bowl and some stew, uh, and then. Was, that's actually one of the questions that I had earlier is, do, I'm just curious if the museum itself has put together some sort of like a recipe book, if you will, for, you know, food, or do you have, do you know, like what, like rough recipes for the types of stews and things that they would have commonly been eating? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, there's a doctoral dissertation on that subject um, on the food prepared in the Navy. Uh, and there's a cookbook available. Um, awesome. and, if you, and, and if you come to the Boston Museum on a Thursday, one of the things they serve on at Thursday lunch is one of the traditional dishes that was served on the ship, which is thick pea soup with slices of sausage in it. And it's amazing. <laughs> We need a field trip. Yep. yep. <laughs> right. Fred, when you say document, do you mean document like as, as sort of citizen scholars or document as media, you know, like footage and photographs that you could well, use? Mostly, mostly what we would want is well lit high resolution photographs of the key moments in the process. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and also we would, uh, we'd want you to document your own experience. Uh, so to your own observations of what you're learning while you're doing it. Um, if you try different methods, for example, I think most of you folks are pretty experienced spoon carvers uh, at this stage, but, um, but why you choose to switch from this tool to this tool at this point in the process. And that, that's the sort of things that you would want somebody who's carving their first spoon to know to save them some heartache. Because, yeah. because cool. we, we, you know, you're you're the kind of the 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 body of the kind of knowledgeable people we're trying to get in touch with for this project, who already have the the right skills. A, a fundamental challenge in experimental archaeology, generally, is to know, as I like to say, whether you're testing the hardware or the software. Are you testing an ancient piece of technology? or are you only testing your brain's ability to comprehend it? Uh, because, for example, most people don't grow up making the rope they need to tie up their cows or forging tools or building boats. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of a, a lecture I heard once where uh, a group of five uh, students had taken a brand new a replica Viking boat uh, on a trip along the north coast of Germany and Poland uh, to test its performance. Uh, now, at the Viking, I used to work at the Viking Ship Museum in Denmark, uh, and this was a normal thing for us to do, but we never tested a new boat until its second or third season uh, with us, because it takes you that long to really learn how the boat performs and to understand how to get the most out of it. Um, mm. But these, but these young folks um, were very ambitious. And the, the head of the project, who was a PhD student, uh, 
who was a per, one of these people who believes in imagined experience and that you don't need to have practical real world experience if you're smart enough and can read enough books. And so he came back and he told, he said at the, in the presentation of their results that this boat will not tack. That is, you can't turn from having the wind on one side to having the wind on the other side by turning the bow across the wind. You have to wear, which is to go around in a three quarters of a circle rather than a quarter of a circle to get to the other side. And it's a fundamental characteristic of, of boats, whether you can tack them or not. Um, but it takes some skill to do it, whereas any fool can, can jibe. And many fools do when they don't mean to. The, and so the, this, this uh, scholar, young scholar, presented his results and, and came had this one conclusion was that this boat won't tack. And one of the experienced sailors and boat builders from the museum heard this and and she wasn't inclined to hold back. And she just said, well, no, you, you've not actually demonstrated the boat won't tack. All you have demonstrated is that you can't tack the boat. That's not the same thing. He said, I happen to know that none of you have any previous experience sailing boats with a single square sail. So we might as well have sent five baker's apprentices to do this. <laughs> That's awesome. She, had, she said, this is why we don't, we don't try to assess the performance of a boat uh until its second or third season is because we have to get to the point we need we need to know the boat well enough and have enough experience ourselves yeah um, because and and acquiring that kind of experience is, is time consuming which is why rather than trying to carve a spoon myself and analyze the process because i've never carved a spoon I, i'm i've done a lot of other kinds of woodworking including building ships and making musical instruments so i'm reasonably confident i could make a spoon but I can't derive a valid conclusion about that process because it's new to, new to me. I, I can tell you what it's like to learn to carve a spoon. I can't tell you what it's like to carve a spoon. Um, when, we, when we did the test of the cannon, one of the problems we had there was that there's nobody in Europe who fires live ammunition out of muzzle loading cannon with black powder anymore. There are reenactor groups that fire salutes, you know, small charges for demonstrations, but they don't actually put a cannonball on top of it or try to hit anything. And so when we were going to test the gun, we needed to minimize, just for the cost, minimize the number of rounds we would have to fire before we were actually learning something about the gun itself, not learning ourselves how to shoot it. And so to act as the gun crew, I imported the 2011 champions in muzzle loading artillery from the United States, because they have a combined more than 160 years experience of shooting live ammunition out of muzzle loading black powder cannon, because there's an organization in the United States that does that. Um, and so they already knew how to handle black powder safely. They already knew how to do the development process with a new piece of artillery to, to narrow down the possibilities, mm -hmm. figure out the optimum charge, and, and figure out the gun's behavior. And so they were able to do that. Uh, you know, out, out of those 54 rounds uh, that we fired, we only needed 20 of those to get to the point where we were testing the gun. Uh, and even those first 20, we could get some useful data out of. Now, there were a lot of really angry Swedish reenactors that we didn't employ them to shoot the cannon. And I had a talk for them at one point, and they were kind of stroppy about it. Um, but I said, all right, how many live rounds have you fired out of your gun? I said, well, we fire, we fire, I said, no, no, I don't mean salutes with a half pound of powder. You know, you're firing, you're firing a 12 pounder cannon. How many times have you put four pounds of gunpowder in it and a 12 pound cannonball and tried to hit a target? When they say, well, none. I said, that's why I imported a gun crew. Mm -hmm. I said, you, you, you have no idea how to hit what you aim at because you have no experience doing it. And I don't have the time or the funding to let you fire the 600 rounds it would take for you to develop that skill. That's why I'd like to work with a group like you folks because nobody has to teach you how to carve spoons. The, between mm -hmm. all of you, you you're, you're bringing years of experience where you've optimized the process you understand what tool to use at what point in the process rather than experimenting with it. 
And that's that kind of knowledge is precious. It's hard to find. Um, I can find lots of archaeologists who are happy to guess about it. Interesting. But their it's conclusions are of very little use. Along those lines, we have spoon carving knowledge, but we all think of ourselves as amateur, amateur right. scholars as well. And we were speculating on a lot of things that we were having imagined experience problems with. Like we were saying, these spoons are so big because they would dip them right into a common vat and then run back to their station and have to eat real fast. And we don't know <laughs> anything about yeah. the, we don't know anything about the society and the culture on board the ship and how they ate. So. Well, I, I can give you the questions short. are along how chow time went down, like how sure. yeah. I can give you the short version of that pretty easily. Uh, the food was prepared centrally in the hold in the, on an open hearth cooked in big pots or small pots. Um, you, you could prepare your own food or you could eat the communal food if you were at sea. Um, the food was served out of those pots into buckets. Uh, what's called a mess kid, which is a stave built bucket about a foot in diameter uh, with a lid on it to keep the contents clean and hot. Uh, and so one person would go down and get the bucket of food and then go back up to the gun decks where the watch who was not on duty would be eating. You don't eat while you're on duty because you need both hands to do your job. So you're fed when you're off watch. Uh, usually the longstanding tradition is that the meals are served at the watch change from one watch to the other the crew is divided into two halves called watches. Um, and so the watch that's about to come on eats their meal right before that. And then as soon as the watch is relieved, the watch that comes off then eats their meal. So it all can be served in two sittings effectively, um, more or less at the same time. So are they eating from a common, that common bucket? We No, not from the bucket. What we believe uh, after Steph's research and several other projects, is that uh, the, the men were divided into messes of six to eight men, plus however many accompanying wives there might have been, uh, which is basically a gun crew uh, as well. Uh, and, this, and those men owned the space between two cannon on one of the gun decks as they're sleeping and, and eating space. Um, and it looks like they were uh, a mess was probably provided with two bowls. Uh, and then the person who was uh, getting the food in the bucket would serve out into the two bowls. Uh, and then the men sitting around those bowls would eat communally from the bowls. And so you might have three or four men uh, dipping their spoons into the one bowl, but they wouldn't have, there we go, there are the bowls, um, that they wouldn't, they wouldn't have to run around while they were doing that. They could sit still and, and have their meal. And traditionally, you don't have a lot of time to eat the meal. Um, and, and the meals are, pre are prepared partly with that in mind. They're not complicated meals to eat. That's one reason stew is popular. Spoon and knife will get you there. Um, sometimes joints of meat uh, that, so that you can cut up. Forks not commonly used for the crew in this period. Very fancy people ate with forks. Um, we might have one on the ship. Was the, there distinctions in the meal between breakfast, if you will, or was it just all stewed all, all the time? No, they, they, they cook different kinds of food at different times a day. Um, so but basically, you, right, but basically you had, you had one big meal and that was the meal served in the middle of the day okay. between the change of the morning and the afternoon watch. Um, and, that, and that's where you got most of your protein and carbohydrates was in that big meal. Uh, and that's the one meal that was certainly certain to be hot um, the, the food you got served for breakfast was generally cold, just like it is in every European hotel I've ever stayed in. Um, the, 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 uh, the continental European tradition of the continental breakfast, of you know, cold cuts and stuff, that, they had that on the ship as well. Um, and then you, they, and, and what you would get at the evening changeover, uh, which would be at uh, six o'clock usually, um, would be... Um, all it would be lighter than the big meal that you got in the middle of the day. Interesting. So does, does that answer the basic question of how food is served? Yeah. yeah. And like I said, I, I think the, the geometry of the spoons is, is directly tied to the kind of food they're eating. Yeah. Um, 
which is which is which is one dish meals um, for efficiency. So here's another now, point of speculation: was did these people only have one spoon that they ate everything out of their whole life? So then the question is: are they choosing the spoon to the meal, or are they just using the spoon that they have? Yeah, oh, that's a cool question. I'm going to throw that one to Steph. Well, one of the things that stood out um, in documenting the spoons was definitely that the length of the handle. And so I guess that sort of goes into what Fred was just saying that, you know, that um, would, you'd have your own spoon and you'd be able to carry it in your pocket. But I don't think I considered much if you would had, you know, in your left pocket, you had your porridge spoon, porridge spoon and in your right pocket, you had your, your pea soup spoon. Um, but I mean, that definitely developed into such with the types of tableware and, and service where we have today. I mean, there's how many different spoons you can see set on a fancy table. That's a, yeah. that's a great question. Yeah, uh, one of the ways we might answer that is looking at containers of personal possessions. Um, because one of the questions we have to ask about all those chests and barrels, uh, I think we've identified at least 24 intact or semi-intact containers of personal possessions on the ship. Uh, and there probably there were more than that to begin with, uh, is that some of them very clearly have one person's possessions in them. Uh, you know, there's one pair of shoes, there's one pair of trousers, there's one bowl and one spoon. Uh, but others appear to have several people using one that Chester barrel communally. There's a there's an example from uh, one spot in the ship where there's a a tankard that had seven spoons in it, all different. Uh, or some of them different. And that might be one mess of seven men who are keeping all their stuff in one container. And that includes the stuff they eat with. Some of the skeletons have a spoon in their pocket, in, in their clothing. And most of these spoons are the size that they would fit in the size of trouser pocket we have preserved in the clothes. So wow. you know, I, guess, I guess you always had to be ready to eat. Um, whereas other people kept spoons in their chests or barrels. Not everybody owned enough stuff to have a chest or a, a barrel or a box. A lot of people showed up on the ship in the clothes they stood up in and a spoon in their pocket um, and, and a knife. The sailor, you had to have a knife. Oh, Matthew says, people had pockets? Of course yeah. people had pockets. <laughs> yeah, well, and that, that uh, you know, you can get by with a spoon and a knife. You were so feeding our fantasies, you know? Um, and our, because there's so much, there's so much imagination around what we're doing and what we, yeah. you know, and um, and the 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 contrast between what we're doing and sort of like it it was a real serious encounter with the with the Vasa spoons because they're so strange in a lot of ways you know like we're yeah. the the last time we're talking about like how the how do you even hold this to eat with it um, well has anybody tried eating with their Vasa spoon oh yeah what do you think what what's what what's what's uh, what's your experience well my my experience is, is it's got a very good mouth feel. Um, but it's more like a shovel because you, <laughs> you have to use it that way. You can't use it sideways on, but it's a good, you know, it, it feels right. really nice in the mouth. Right. But it only goes in your mouth one way. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. But, but very efficient. Mm -hmm. um, you can get quite a lot on it. Yeah. Like taste of oil. Yeah. All right. It, how, what about the angle between the bowl and the handle? Is that? Any, does that give you any thought? I think on the one we just did, it seems more like a soup spoon. You know, the this this recent one that you said it was more popular, you know, because yeah. of the crank. You know, for me, hitting that, you know, it would be more drinking the, the soup okay. you know, out of it from the side from the side point. But then you had these other ones that we did on the first the first one, they were a little wider. Yeah. And they're pretty big. I you can't get your whole mouth up, you know, I can't right. get my whole mouth into it. So, you know, you're either, you know, that's where my guess was they were eating a lot of soups and, and stews just because you're not you sticking could pour it into your thing. mouth. You're yeah. not sticking this whole thing in your mouth because many of the sizes, I, unless they were huge people, you know, I can't get that, get that right, in your mouth. I have smaller thoughts. on average than us. So. I have some thoughts on, I have some thoughts on that, which is if you were only having one spoon for your whole life, you would want it to be able to accommodate every type of food you'd eat. So you'd want it to have crank and you'd want it to be large to eat 
soups and stews, but since you're also eating other things besides soups and stews with that same spoon, you want the spoon to be large so it can hold stuff. And I don't think when you eliminate forks and other stabbing implements from how we eat, I think you want a large bowl to be able to lift large objects to your mouth, but that you're not necessarily putting that whole spoon into your mouth as you do today with small metal spoons. Right, oh, and, and, but don't forget that everybody has, is equipped with 10 eating utensils. What are those 10 eating utensils? Oh, they're fingers, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, and so is stuff that's too big to fit in the bowl of a spoon, you should be able to pick up and put in your mouth with your hand. And even though it's, we now consider that impolite unless you're eating fried chicken, the, um, there's plenty, plenty of evidence that in loads and loads of cultures around the world, the primary eating implement is your hand. Um, and, and that, or that you, you, your hand assisted by something like bread. Uh, and so another eating implement that they had would have been the bread that they um, were served, which is quite stiff and hard. So you could have used that to shovel stuff out of the, out of the bowl as well. Could it also it, have, could it also have been that you start with a big spoon and after a while of eating it, since you not a very good carver of spoons, get smaller in time? Uh, just by where you mean? Yeah. No, that, that's possible. I, I also wonder if the, um, the shape of the spoon has to do with something that's efficient for getting food out of the shape of bowl that we have. Even if they were less squeamish about using their fingers, I have to imagine they still didn't want the stuff from the food to get onto their hands and then transfer to things and the stuff on their hands to get onto their food. And if food was things like hot, right, they would still need an implement. Hmm. I would, I would say they probably didn't worry about that a lot, but I can't actually provide any evidence to support that thought. I, I've, I've worked, I've, I've worked enough on ships in my life that I've eaten plenty of meals that had a fair share of tar in them because um, I didn't, you know, didn't have a chance to clean my uh, hands. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I know that we are... Well, my, my wife, by the way, is just showing me this, uh, which is a typical modern English soup spoon, um, which has a similar kind of shape to it. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's intended to tip the, spoon, the, the goods into your mouth from the side. Yep. Hello, Tama. <laughs> Stephanie says hello, Emma. Hey, Emma says hello. The, the um, question of cranks interesting because if you've got a good crank, you can get out of a deeper bowl. But the bowls that you showed were quite shallow, and this is also you probably recognise this. Yeah. Um, and that's got hardly any crank at all on it, but it's still a nice spoon to eat with. Yeah. But not so easy to get out of a deep bowl. Right. I think this that one, and was, that one, this one you is have trouble with by, liquid in that, I think. Yeah, this is, so if it's a thick stew, it's, it's easier to eat than it would a sloppy soup or something. Yeah. So something thick's easier. This one is actually made by Bet Moon. Do you know Bet from Satterglanton? Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, was, just, I was up at Satterglanton three weeks ago to give a talk. So. Right. Well, she made this one. Yeah. And, it's, and that's, it's from the same um same collection as this this spoon yeah. yeah yeah well i recognize that one so yeah so i just want to note there were two minutes to 10 o'clock i know uh fred that you had said that that was going to be kind of your time frame for when you felt you needed to uh skedaddle um so right. I, I just before the time is gone does anybody have any burning question, last question that they want to ask Fred, that they've been like just sitting there and, and dying to break into the conversation. If not, then, Sorry. go ahead, Sorry. Alistair. Um, Stephanie did allude to it in her comment um, that, that a, a lot of the spoons seem to have something on the surface. So uh, well, I'd be surprised that they were oiled, but that maybe they were. Well, in terms of a finish, like some yeah, sort of yeah. an applied yeah. finish. Some of them are painted, so 
Yeah, that's what I was going to I was going to reference when we were on our last discussion in the recording with Stephanie, she had referred to the fact that some of them had an obvious painted finish that was, you know, on there. Um, I don't remember if we had reached any conclusion as to what that might be or like what the what the makeup of it was. I don't remember. Was there any analysis done on that to know? Was it like a varnish type of a, a finish? Actually, um, Emma helped with or did the type of analysis on one of the very tiny bits of, I believe that we thought it was paint. And I, I took that back to the US. I can't, I, the type of test that we did, I, it escapes me right now. Um, spec, spectrometry, maybe? Uh, mass yeah. spectrometry, yeah. Yeah. And um, it definitely identified uh, the paint color that we thought was similar to what was on all the sculptures. Is that right, Fred? Am I remembering that yeah. right? Yeah. And it, it, if I were going to guess, I would say that it's probably an oil paint. Yeah, um, I was going to say like like some sort of a um, like almost like a like a linseed oil. It would, it would have been it, it would have been yeah. linseed oil. That's the standard uh, carrier medium um, for the paint for paint used on wood surfaces in Sweden in this yeah. period. Yeah, and some of them are painted inside the bowl. Like we know we we yep. usually paint the handle, but not the bowl because it seems more hygienic. But yeah, yeah. all over. Okay. Yeah, what, Although what, with linseed the... oil, we often use like raw linseed oil as our finish for spoons. Some people yeah. don't like the smell and taste, so they've moved to other, you know, forms of, of uh, curing oils. But I would, you know, it would just logically it makes sense that linseed would be probably the well, and and then linseed oil paint um, makes a really good durable finish. You know, it, it's yeah. some of the, it's still some of the best paint you can use on wood. Um, it just takes a very long time to dry. And a basic rule of thumb for paint is the longer it takes to dry, the longer it will last. Um, and so I, I wouldn't have any trouble imagining that. And then you just have to wonder what the um, what the pigment is that, that's yep. in the in the linseed oil binder. Interesting. All right. So, well, listen. Let me um, I, just thank you so much. It was wonderful to have you here with us. Um, I'm going to drop back out to my gallery view. Hold on. Um, sure. And Fred, uh, thank you so much for your time and for your interest in what we're doing. Um, if we want to, like, we should, at some point, we need to coordinate, like, what you, like, how, how we collect our experiential efforts uh, and our experimental archaeology efforts at reproducing um, some of the Vasa items. Like, I'm just not sure how we go about organizing this. So, Matt, if between you and I, we could coordinate maybe, I, I don't know, Stephanie, is this something that you would be part of? Or I mean, Fred, should we, well, with Fred there at the Vasa, it makes more sense to have him unless he wants my help with it, um, which I'd be, of course, glad to do. I'll, I'll bring him over to Stockholm. <laughs> How about there that? There you go. There we are. Well, I mean, we don't actually need the finished spoons. We need the the, the, the writing the and the, the photos, but we'll need to provide information to people. Uh, and so Stephanie is the one who sits on that knowledge okay. of what the spoons are like. Um, so if, if between the two of us, we can provide the necessary data on materials and shapes and finishes and things like that. And then if Chuck and Matthew can act as sort of the conduits to get information out to the carvers and then information back from them to us, um, that would yep. be, that would, that would work fine for us. Mm -hmm. okay, uh, and great. then at some point we would need you to sign your life away to say we can use your pictures and text and stuff like that. Which means we'll need every carver to sign their life away to say that we can use their pictures and text, <laughs> which is fine. Um, I think I think people would be very excited. I mean, I'm speculating. I don't know, but I'm I'm sure people would be very excited to be part of this. We actually had the idea of sending the actual spoons over to you, so that I, I know people probably can't go in and handle the artifacts. But if you have right. actual reproduction spoons, it might be a fascinating part of your exhibit for people to be able to have some things that they can touch, feel, and uh, experience. But I don't well, know. Well, the, we actually, the people who would use the spoons are the museum teachers. 
Okay. Um, because they because they are the ones who who do those kinds of uh, visits where people handle stuff, and mostly it's, it's school kids. Um, uh, we don't we don't have a real, a real good way for the general public to to do that sort of thing because our general public pre pandemic anyway was was too makes, big makes sense too, too yep. many people but for the school programs we do a lot of experiential education with in a reconstructed section of the gun deck with chests full of personal possessions and if we had a whole bunch of spoon copies they could serve a meal they could serve them pea soup with real boss of spoons or something like that. Awesome. Um, well, we, so we would be I'll interested talk, in doing that. You you let us know if you want it or not. Sure. I'll talk to museum teachers and ask them if that would be of interest to them uh, and okay. let you know. Awesome. All right. And and, and Steph, before I go, uh, say hello to your mom. Well. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, Emma and I are going to be in Bozeman in the summer oh. this year uh, with our older son and his wife going on a pack trip up in the Hill Guard. Oh, that sounds amazing. About uh, when? Uh, late, last, uh, tail end of July. Okay, maybe I'll see so you. If, so if you're around, that we'll, we'll grow. But we'll have to go to your mom's uh, cafe for lunch at some point. That sounds great. All right. All right. Thank you so much, Fred. We really appreciate it. Yeah, My thanks pleasure. very thank much. You, thank you for all your spoons. And that you're supposed to hold your spoons up so I can see. Yeah, it everybody, if, you, if you've got a spoon, hold it up. Get it on, get it on there so that Fred can see them. I apologize. Yeah. I didn't want to interrupt the flow of the conversation uh, to go into show and tell because we were having such fascinating conversation oh, and great questions. So this yeah, is see, wonderful I, to see everybody's spoons. Oh, I, I remember the one that Matt's yeah. doing. Uh, and there's uh, yeah. Jurgens. Yeah, I know that. I know that one on the on the left. Yeah, Chuck, take because, a screenshot. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, I remember oh, yeah. that one with the hook on the end. And then, oh, it's so uh, but, neat to see them all. Kalen's, I love the one. I remember that one with the the lined. Yeah, and then Bettina has uh, one that looks like it's made out of some really interesting wood. What, what kind of wood is Somebody else that? grab a screenshot real quick because all I can do is take a picture with my phone. My company has my laptop locked down, so I can't take anything off of it. But Bettina, is that walnut, did you say? It's walnut, yeah. Okay. It's Charlie walnut, actually. Oh, yeah. I, oh, I, built yeah. A flint, I built a flintlock rifle out of that kind of stuff once. It was gorgeous yeah. when it was done. This one is in in the process, only half made. You were asking oh, okay. the process. There's yep. Strong. What there. kind of wood is that one? This is cherry. Cherry. Oh, lovely. And and to get to that stage uh, uh, of of, uh, of it, what tool is? It looks like a draw knife, or it was just a? Are you just carving? It was a carving knife and an axe, a hatchet. Okay. All right. Started with a hatchet. Good. Yep. And Alistair, what have you got there? If you speak, you end up in the big view in the middle. You can, you can also set it to uh, gallery view. I was, I was on um, mute. Mulberry. Oh, mulberry. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. It, because yeah. it happened, I happened to have a piece that was the right shape. That's why. Uh, okay. I wouldn't cool. choose it normally. Right. And then Sunny, yours? This is apple wood. Apple. Oh, ooh, that's nice stuff. It's pretty. I, I, I have I have some apple that I'm using for tool handles that came from a friend's tree. If you carve it when it's green, it's it's usable. If you wait till it dries, it's very very tough. Yeah. Yeah. And Hartford would have you. Oh, you did the hook spoon as well, Hartford. Yeah, that's uh, birch. It's about the only wood I have out here in the mountains that I can carve with. Yeah, and we do have uh, birch ones. And I, I've always been curious about that hook because it looks like it's for hanging it in a loop of something. Under your belt, you can stick it or, under or your you belt. Could, or you could stick it under your belt. I hadn't thought of that. That's a possibility. I think it also stops it slipping into the bowl if it's on the edge. Right, so although the normal, uh, the normal attire of this period does not include a belt, okay. you know, your trousers are held up uh, or breeches are held up by being hooked to the inside of your jacket. Hmm. And, and and trow and trousers have flies, uh, but no zips or buttons, because uh, your shirt is your underwear and it comes down to your knees. And then uh, before you put your trousers on, you you tuck it the long tail down between your legs and bring it up in the back um, to to hide your privates from the world. So.
It sounds like a, a wedgie recipe. <laughs> yeah, it, it is kind of, but the, but the trousers are pretty full cut, so you, they don't, uh, it's not too right. <laughs> Anyone else want to show me a spoon here? I'm curious. I have oh, this Judy. Really, I have this really short handled spoon that I carved from Beach, American Beach. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. I Are, have the, the 20414 with the. Oh, yeah, with the, nice. yes. The, right. uh, with the faceted handle. That's a lovely one. Yeah, Kaylin that has one that is, also. I yep. think that one's so graceful. Uh, yeah, and then I, Michael has a couple. And then I added some paint into the chip carved lines because oh, nice. we talked on the last call, we talked about personalization and decoration. So I painted yep. in those chip carved lines. And this one's big leaf maple from Washington. Okay. Yeah, we have we have a native uh, maple that's used for some stuff on the ship. So there, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a spoon in that as well. Great job, everybody. They look fantastic. They're beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. It's It's been a pleasure to join you today. Um, thank you so much, Fred. It's been wonderful having you here. Thank you for sharing all of your uh, knowledge and, and experience there and uh, for inviting us to have a kind of cool uh, participation in it. This is really neat. My, my pleasure. I'll, I'll get back to sewing now. Awesome. <laughs> Good. All right. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you. All right, everybody, it is now 10 past uh, 10, roughly, East Coast time here in the US. We've been on for about an hour and 40 minutes. Um, we have not had a chance to actually go through and do a traditional show and tell. This was sort of a quick, everybody hold up your spoon show and tell. I don't know what people's timing is like. If you wanna stay around, I'm more than happy to go into our traditional show and tell at this point. Uh, although this particular video is going to be a very large one. Maybe what I should do is stop recording and then start again for our normal show and tell. That way we can post them as two separate recordings. Good idea. Right. Yeah, I think I'm going to do that. I'm going to stop. Chuck, I can edit it regardless. I can chop it in half and make two different videos. Oh, all right. Then I'll just let it keep going. Yep.